Hello, this is Digital Accessibility, the people behind the progress. I'm Joe Walensky, the creator and host of this series. And as an accessibility professional myself, I find it very interesting as to how others have found their way into this profession. So let's meet one of those people right now and hear about their journey. All right, well, here we go with another episode where I have the great opportunity to meet with an accessibility professional. And today I am talking with David Schlebenbach. Hello, David, how are you today? Doing great, Joe. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, it's good to have a chance to uh, chat with you. I'm located in my home office of Vashon Island, which is near Blink's Seattle headquarters. Where are you talking to us from? I'm coming today from Lafayette, Indiana, at our corporate headquarters and factory uh, near Purdue University. All right. Well, I've been there, been to uh, the campus, uh, and it's West Lafayette for the campus, right? That's right. Yeah, the two are separated by the Wabash River. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's good to have a chance to uh, chat with you. And uh, probably the best place to start is if you talk a little bit about what you're involved with today. No problem. Um, and I appreciate that. Uh, my project that I'm working on right now involves a Braille tablet computer for blind and visually impaired people as well as people with other types of specialized disabilities that need tactile or haptic input. And uh, this is sort of an extension of work I've been doing for the past 25 to 30 years or so to try to help teach people with disabilities topics like science and math and, and other advanced technical topics. And so uh, yeah, uh, with that uh, type of work, can you talk a little bit about the technology that's involved and, and maybe something about what a, a day in the life or a week in the life uh, is like for you. Sure, no problem. Uh, to talk about the technology, probably the simplest thing I can do is just very quickly demonstrate it. So I'm, I'm just gonna flip my view here. And what you'll be seeing on, on my screen is the computer code that we have written to control the, the technology. And then here I have an example of, a, of the tablet product. And what we have here are actually four separate small tablets. These are each about the size and shape of an iPhone. And they connect together by Bluetooth to do various things. And in this case, I'm actually navigating through some menus, picking things, and, and I'll just pick a, a simple illustration, which is a screensaver. And this is a, a tactile bouncing ball screensaver, which just is the same thing as a screensaver would be for you know, a TV or a phone. Um, the idea is that we have thousands of pins that move up and down and make a, a tactile feeling that a user can feel with their fingers. And each one is like a pixel would be on a regular phone or tablet computer. So in a nutshell, that's exactly what we're doing. The, the reason that this is so difficult is to make a dense object that has all of these pixels that a blind person could feel requires pushing the boundaries of physics and manufacturing and computer science. And we've had to really innovate in a lot of different areas to get to the point that we're located at, um, including building a high-tech automated assembly factory, which I happen to be standing in right now. And if it's okay with you, I could I very quickly show what that looks like. Yeah, definitely. Please do that. All right. Again, I'll flip the camera. And so this is just an example of um, various pieces of equipment we have in our facility. Uh, and as an example of how this works, each of these individual components that go into this tablet device are small modules. Each module has um, the equivalent of, a, of um, 32 pixels. And these are assembled using um, a high-tech assembly system, which is a series of robots that do automated robotic assembly. I'm, I'm showing a table now where this assembly is done. So the individual components are manufactured uh, throughout the state of Indiana largely. 95% of our components are either manufactured here in this facility or in our supply chain, which is uh, spread throughout the state of Indiana. 
We have a few other US-based providers for the remaining parts. These individual components are then put together to create this tablet that I showed. Um, and as an example, these modules basically snap onto a circuit board. And then from this circuit board, we have the ability to control how these um, pins move up and down. And those that's what the, the user actually feels. So this is all done from the, from the modular assembly all the way to the product assembly uh, for the end user. The reason we went this route is when we came up with the basic idea, which dates back, interestingly enough, to over 25 years ago, the base technology wasn't there to do a project like this. So in addition to developing that base technology, we had to develop everything from that point forward. So we came up with the idea, then we had to develop the parts to make the, the thing work. We had to develop the robots to make the parts, the procedures to run the robots. Then we had to develop the software to run the device, everything. So this has been a real odyssey, a real challenge. And I've been in the assistive technology field now for around 25 years, and this is by far the most technically challenging project I've ever been involved with. Well, it's really good to uh, be able to see the inner workings there. Uh, yeah, with most of the guests on the program, we talk about uh, digital accessibility, but ultimately, uh, all of that digital accessibility work is all about being able to uh, have devices like yours uh, lock into that and be able to interpret that information. So it's uh, it's 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 great to uh, you know, see some some of that from your end, and and then also when I go to uh, conferences like CSUN and walk around the exhibit area and and look at it, it, it it's just amazing uh, the 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 breadth and variety of uh, excessive uh, assistive technologies that are available. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, I, I'm a big believer in application of mainstream technology to help people with disabilities. Uh, you know, we all work as assistive technology professionals with the concept of universal design for learning, which is to design things from the ground up to have accessibility features built in. And in assistive technology, one challenge is that we, we tend to make products for smaller market niches than the consumer electronics world. For example, if you're marketing a product for mobility impairment or learning disability or visual impairment, you may be reaching a fraction of the population that normally would purchase a, a particular device. And that's a challenge for startup companies in this space because acquiring funding convincing uh, financial institutions to back you, making sure that you can scale your production facilities. Those are all things that would be much easier if you had a larger volume. So when you can piggyback those two things, when you can utilize mainstream tech in a new way or put together in new ways to benefit a person with disabilities, suddenly the economy of scale benefits um, you as well. And then this whole process gets easier. And that was a key focus when we started this we decided that we were gonna go with mainstream, a high-tech automated assembly, manufacturing techniques. We're gonna work with top level technicians and scientists. My background is in science. We were gonna use mainstream programming techniques. Everything we did would be done as if we were operating as a company like Apple and making a mainstream consumer product. And that would result in the best quality product for the user as well as the lowest possible cost. And I was very fortunate and blessed to have partners that ag agreed to go into this journey with me and, and help me uh, together with um, institutional investment and, and supportive organizations like Purdue and the state of Indiana to get to this point. Well, uh, I, I definitely want to ask you a few more questions uh, about uh, your work and your product. But uh, one of the things that we always like to do in this program is to find out how people made their way to where they are today, different uh, circuitous, serendipitous uh, paths. Uh, so what was uh, it for you? Uh, maybe go back in time and talk about some of the, the milestones that started to move you to where you are today. Very good. It's interesting when you talk to people in this field, I'm sure you come up with this all the time, you'll find that there are so many people that have a personal connection, which drew them in 
to, to help people with disabilities. Uh, I think we all have a story somewhere in our life. And I have a number of those. I've been very fortunate over the years to work with thousands of blind and visually impaired people and hundreds of people with other types of disabilities. And, and I, could, I could tell so many anecdotes, but to go back to the start of this, I actually came to Purdue University for graduate school in uh, what was called the chemical physics program. So I was in a very technical field and I had some exposure to um, disabilities. My first wife who, who passed from cancer in the 2010s was a, a visually impaired and, and was a braille reader. So when I came to Purdue, I was teaching chemistry. And if you know anything about large universities, general chemistry for freshmen and, and sophomores, there were literally 5,000 students in the class. Okay. No, I don't even get me. I went to the University of Illinois and that was like one of the worst, those large classes were yeah. one of my worst experiences ever. That's right. So 5,000 students in the class. I was assigned to teach some of them. Uh, and as it turned out, we had three blind students enrolled in that chemistry class, which is really sort of a first um, for Purdue. And as I discovered later, this is in the 1990s, it was a, you know really sort of a first for the country. I mean, there weren't a lot of blind students pursuing those technical fields. So I got assigned to teach those blind students chemistry because I was the guy that knew something you know, because I knew one slight notch more than everybody else, right? <laughs> so I started to do research in the area and said, okay, well, you know, there must be some program or technology or techniques. And what I discovered is there, there really wasn't a lot of, of such technology or techniques, and we had to develop some on our own. So I ended up starting a research program at Purdue, which was called the Visions Lab. We developed a lot of techniques and methods for helping teach science and math to students with disabilities, primarily visual impairment. And along the way, it, it's, I sort of drifted from going into academic research in the sciences as a career into assistive technology as, as a career because I just found the problem so interesting, so challenging, uh, so much detail, and, and a very human touch. You know, it, it, when I was studying uh, the mysteries of the universe, so to speak, it was helpful to humanity, but, but we didn't really impact anyone's life directly. You know, I, I was doing laser spectroscopy, computational chemistry, things that are pretty esoteric, quantum mechanics. Whereas when I would give a blind student a Braille book, or I would help them learn how to use a computer, I would see their life change right in front of me. And that was hard to pass up on. So as it turns out, the president of Purdue, Dr. Jiski at the time, started a, a tech transfer and entrepreneurship program. And he approached me and said, hey, I, I think you might be good at, at being an entrepreneur. How would you like to do that? Well, I thought, how hard could it be <laughs> if I only knew now, knew then what I know now? So I went through their accelerator and uh, incubator program. Purdue had one of the first such programs in the country, which are now commonplace at universities. And my initial uh, company that I started in, in around the year 2000, I had three different ideas that I presented to my investors, one of which had to do with accessibility. And that's the one they liked the most. I, I was funded by a group of farmers who had actually sold their um, grain elevators to a larger uh, company and were looking to invest in tech. And they thought that helping disabled people was really cool. I was very lucky to meet them. So they funded our company with a small investment and away we went. And I then uh, have since then been a serial entrepreneur, so to speak, which probably means I know where the bodies are buried, right? <laughs> and uh, I've been in the assistive technology field ever since. And uh, uh, so uh, in, the, in the time that you went from university to uh, uh, being involved in uh, all of your uh, business enterprise activities, uh, were there, uh, did, did, you, did you discover accessibility as being a pr profession or was it just because you were, and meshing it, sometimes you don't see the broader things 
uh, going yeah. going around. What what was that experience like for you? Well, there's a lot of uh, pitfalls, I think I would say, in transitioning. And it was really two factors. One is transitioning from being an academic to being in business. Um, I was very fortunate to have a lot of uh, good advisors. Purdue provided a lot of these folks, some of which I still use as advisors and mentors today, still work with me today. And they sort of help guide me to understand how different the business world is than the academic world. Completely different pace, different priorities, different uh, f- resources and funding mechanisms. And I actually have, in turn, uh, tried to help mentor academics who want to transition into business. And then more specifically, with assistive technology, when, when I dove into this in the 90s, there were people doing this, but it was largely done by nonprofit organizations, NGOs and foundations, government agencies. There were some businesses, of course, but at the time, there wasn't even really a formal industry association. Uh, I was um, one of the uh, founding board members of the Assistive Technology Industry Association, which started with just a very small group of companies. And now today is quite a big uh, organization, has a conference annually, and there, there are people that come together to talk about assistive technology as a field. As you know from your work, the idea of an assistive technology professional, having certifications and um, certificates and being able to demonstrate competencies, that's all stuff that's relatively new for our industry. You know, it maybe dates back 10 years, 15 years at the most, and not something like if, if you went into um, manufacturing or if you went into um, information technology, where this, this has been an established field where there's a lot of money and attention. So I'm very glad to have seen the industry develop to where it is now. Uh, I've, I've recently worked with some younger academics who are wanting to transition into the assistive technology business space and hearing their stories and listening to them. I can say, here is a possibility for where you can get some funding. Here are some people that can give you advice about your legal or financial matters. Here is some business consulting that you can draw from. Here are industry resources in the AT field that you can draw from for statistics, data, market research. None of that existed before these various groups came together and helped create that. And and I have to say, I'm kind of proud of our industry for doing it because what it's done is it's made the field more professional and given all of us collectively a better ability to help people with disabilities in a professional way. And the work that was done prior to this with the nonprofits and the governments was fantastic, but nothing takes the place of high tech companies producing products directly to consumers and and getting that feedback that they can iterate on quickly to make those products better and better. I, I said at the beginning, we wanted to emulate a company like an Apple or a Microsoft or a Google and, and try to accomplish our goal that way. And I, I still believe very much in that model, as long as it's tempered with the understanding that whatever the company is doing, it must always be done for social good. And that means you have to be selective with your investment. If you just go to a bank and ask for traditional financing, they're not going to understand what you're doing. So collecting investment, setting up your business structure, those are things that are a little bit different in the assistive technology space. Still done professionally, but done with people who are like-minded and, and not just in this to make money. Well, I, you know, one of the things I've enjoyed about being involved in accessibility is it's a great community of uh, practitioners uh, openly sharing information. Uh, in fact, the uh, the the building of our knowledge base just continues every day. People are so. Uh, generous with their uh, time to uh, add to that. So we really have a great repository of of content. And and as you mentioned, the certification opportunities, I I constantly see more and more people with that appended to their LinkedIn profile that they have one uh, certification or or another. It's great to uh, see all of that. Um, For for me personally, I got involved uh, early on when the the uh, web accessibility initiative was just beginning with the uh, with the W3C and, and and today those of us involved in digital accessibility essentially we look to the 
to the WCAG is our uh, recipe book of recommendations. So theoretically, if you follow along with these uh, things, the idea is that assistive devices will be able to uh, be successful. But what's it like from the end of, uh, from, from your end, where you're an organization developing assistive technologies and you're relying on that to be built in? Uh, kind of an open-ended question, but how do yeah. you feel about where things are today with that? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I spend a lot of time on standards bodies and committees uh, myself over the years. And you're right, um, in terms of the, the source content, so to speak, we have some pretty good specifications now from W3C and other standards bodies that, that say, okay, here is how a publisher should create content so that it's available for the assistive technology products to hook onto. However, what I've seen is, um, unfortunately, the, we don't have quite as robust specifications or standards on the actual product side. But those are, there's many that are in development. We have some from the mainstream that we borrow. For example, uh, hardware products would have FCC certification, UL or CE, Rojas, Bluetooth and USB, et cetera. So those are helpful. But those are really just talking about how the device as a whole interoperates with general technology. We don't have a very good and robust specification for something like a product UI or UX. How should a hardware device be featured so that it has the appropriate buttons, dials, knobs, whatever you want to call it for a user? There's a lot of that stuff is homebrewed by individual companies. And, and I think it's a, it's a bit of a shame because we could all benefit from collective knowledge and wisdom in that area. If I'm a user and I move from one device to another, I would sure appreciate a common interface so there's not so much of a learning curve. And likewise, the method by which the data from a publisher repository and so forth is, is intaked into the device and converted into some output format, there's still a few gaps, I think, in that, I'll call it the pipeline of how that actually happens. As an example, if you follow the appropriate uh, WCAG standards on a website, have your ARIA role attributes set and so forth, all the details taken care of, it's still a little bit open-ended how an assistive technology software product or hardware device would render that to the user. Maybe we need more robust and direct and clear specifications on how rendering should happen. Maybe it's okay to let it be something where the user can decide Maybe the user should decide within a sort of a range of parameters. I don't know the answer. I just think it's worth talking about as a community. And if you look at uh, the mainstream browser world, for example, there are some general guidelines that browser manufacturers really sort of have to stay within. They've left room for them to be creative so that a Microsoft Edge has certain features different than, say, Chrome, right? But at the same time, it's understood or expected that users will generally have a similar experience if they're using one browser or another. And so I, I think some tightening of the specs could be a benefit in that area to the actual product manufacturers. Well, uh, you're looking at where you're at with uh, your product and 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 kind of what you see in the in the industry, um, what are your uh, thoughts or hopes about uh, moving forward? Are there any areas that you're passionate about in exploring uh, for the future? Uh, any any uh, things you can give us to maybe look forward to that we haven't thought about? Yes, absolutely. The biggest thing for me is thinking about changing the life of someone with a visual impairment directly. And when you think about how technology works for all of us nowadays, it's a lifestyle companion. We don't just use our technology to sit at a desk and do work. We carry it with us everywhere. It's ubiquitous and it's, it affects every aspect of our life. And I know from my own personal experience, when you're uh, a blind individual, you don't just set aside all of your blindness, so to speak, when you're done with your job or your school. You carry it with you everywhere. You have a need that, that permeates your life, and we want to help benefit that. And I think of specific examples. A blind person can struggle using appliances like a washing machine or a microwave because they're flat touch screens with buttons that are hard to feel, and you can't see the information on the screen. 
why shouldn't your device be a personal information hub that connects to that and, and helps you with that? All the appliances now are Internet of Things enabled anyway. Another example would be going to a store and trying to differentiate products on a shelf, picking out your clothing for the day and making sure that your, your color coordination is where you want it to be. Being able to read a book while you're waiting for the bus, which you're probably taking because you rely on public transportation. Navigating a map to get on that bus, get on the right bus, make the transfer to the correct bus, get to your place of employment or, or wherever it is that you were trying to go. Going to a doctor's office or a hospital, trying to navigate your medical records, trying to read the disclaimers on the medications that you're taking so that you have informed consent for whatever procedures that you need to have. Trying to watch a movie on Netflix, trying to listen to a baseball game. If you're uh, a senior citizen and your vision is failing, being able to read a newspaper to your grandchild or a book. What about being able to play tic-tac-toe as a parent of a blind child with your child? All of these are things that we want to enable with this pocket size portable life companion. That's, it's not just about building you know, another braille display that helps you access text on a computer. It's about changing your life. And one of the things that I think is so amazing about our industry, when I, when I go to these conferences you mentioned, like the CSUN conference or ATIA, or closing the gap or all the other ones that are out there, you see these variety of products that really are designed to change someone's lifestyle. And I think consumer electronics could take a bit of a clue from us, right? Um, sometimes we live our lives in spite of our consumer technology instead of our consumer technology enabling our lifestyle. And, and that's where we're headed with with what we're doing is it's not just about that the piece of hardware you carry with you. It's about what you can do with that. Well, you, you, you just uh, went through so many great examples. It, it's uh, clear that you're uh, just always thinking about these uh, new opportunities and it gives me a lot of things personally to, to think about that I hadn't considered before. So uh I appreciate that. And, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me uh, in this conversation. I think we covered a, quite a lot of things in a short amount of time, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, talk to us about it. It's no problem. I appreciate being here. And I would just like to uh, offer on a side note, if um, any of your listeners are, are new to the assistive technology field or have questions or or would like to uh, learn a little bit more about what it might take to be an entrepreneur in this area, um, I would be happy to have them reach out to me uh, offline and uh, maybe I can answer some of their questions. I, I was very, very fortunate and blessed to have so many advisors give of their time to me as I was learning. And I, do, I really believe in paying that forward. It's a small enough industry as it is, we should all help each other. And uh, we do end up uh, including show notes along with this. So make sure uh, we get any uh, relevant links and things uh, from you uh, attached to that as well. Very good. All right. Thanks a lot, Dave. It was nice to chat with you. Hopefully we can meet at one of those uh, physical events that we talked about. I would love to see you there. Thank you so much. And uh, goodbye to all the listeners. <laughs>